Rushwood Center at Ryerson Woods presents the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Rushwood Center is located in the Ryerson Woods Forest Preserve in Riverwoods, Illinois, and honors this land as the traditional home of the Council of Three Fires. Today, Brushwood Center continues to be a place where many people from diverse backgrounds find healing, vitality, and relationship with nature. You can learn more and support this work at brushwoodcenter.org. Now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. This year, the Smith Nature Symposium Series explores what it will take to build a more just and sustainable future in the aftermath of COVID-19. Welcome to the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. So finally, I am so excited to introduce John Wasik today. Um, John is an award-winning writer and journalist and also happens to be a Lake County Commissioner as well. Um, with a passion for sustainability and renewable energy. And John will be moderating uh, today's event. So with that, I will welcome John to take over. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I think, I think it's everybody's dream to be introduced by no less than Bill Curtis with swelling music. And, and thanks so much for this kind of invitation. Thanks to all the sponsors, especially Adele. Uh, and we are sorry for your loss. So we are going to proceed from some very bad news to some very good news, we hope. Uh, the bad news, all you have to do is turn on the TV or look at the news to see what's happening out west. Uh, the big picture, of course, is, is not looking good, as Bill McKibben will you will tell you we're over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that of course is causing some catastrophic damage everywhere uh, especially with wildfires tornadoes hurricanes extreme flooding everywhere so uh, it, it is a global uh, climate crisis that we're dealing with and we need to uh, approach some addressable solutions like yesterday. So we have three just extraordinary guests today for you, uh, experts in their field. Um, I have to introduce Kelly Shelton first because I'm working with her on Lake County. She's our consultant and she's doing just a, a smashing job in getting us rolling towards our goal. And speaking of Lake County, this just happened two days ago and it's a great way, way to start this panel. Uh, we passed the county board uh, a climate action plan. So it, it's basically a couple of a legs to it, 50% uh, reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 and hopefully the rest by 2040. Uh, we're going with a, a very comprehensive approach. We're doing net zero buildings and all our new construction. Uh, we're going to hybrid electric vehicles. We're reducing our waste by 60%. Uh, in about 10 years, uh, hopefully sooner, but uh, we're, we're doing all these things in conjunction with Kelly's uh, profound advice and also with uh, the cooperation of everybody here. Um, uh, we also have Craig Sieben, who's, who's, who's a, a really fantastic uh, energy expert. He's been doing this a long time and he's going to offer us some great insights into new technologies, existing technologies, and, and how do we move forward on this. And then there's Jen Walling, who is executive director of the Illinois Environmental Council. There's nobody more uh, out there in terms of uh, pushing towards legislative solutions than Jen. Jen's working so hard to, to get us um, to the point where government is, is putting in place incentives, programs, ideas to, to get us where we need to be. So um, I'm going to introduce them soon, but I, I just want to make one note that, you know, in this current crisis, we are very focused on solutions and, and these panelists are, are going to help tell us how do we get there. We know where we're at, how do we get there, uh, and what can we do. So with that, I'm going to start with Craig. Craig has a few slides that are going to kind of open up your, your mind to some, some new idea, some new ideas, maybe some old ideas. and. Uh, Craig, take it away. 
You are muted, Craig. Okay. There we go. Thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you, Catherine. And I just have to say that, you know, Adele Simmons signed my college diploma. Wow. College. And uh, I know her well and uh, knew John and also condolences for the family. Um, you know, I, I think in, in, in contemplating this discussion, well, first off, my name is Craig Steven and I work for the, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on uh, renewables in Illinois and really just try to, and I'm even going to set a timer here because I'll tell you something, this conversation could go, you could just keep talking. I'm going to limit myself here so we get to conversation and discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about solar energy, a little bit about wind, and then battery storage, looking at some broader trends. Um, and in my work life, jump to the next slide, please. Uh, I work for AECOM. It's a global engineering firm uh, that is really one of the largest infrastructure and engineering firms in the world. And one of the reasons I merged my practice uh, at Sieben Energy Associates into AECOM was because the need to scale solutions. Um, there is a tremendous amount of good news relative to the cost of technologies in solar, wind, and, and others, and batteries. But, you know, I'm just part of a, a large juggernaut uh, that really a company like ours has critical responsibility for how can we operationalize, how, we, how can we bring at scale carbon reduction solutions. Um, so that's my, my work. I'm a director in the power group, the energy group. And my primary focus is on energy efficiency in buildings, but that's also renewable. It's also uh, you know, driven with lots of different dynamics now. And I've spent my career focusing on energy efficiency. And I know some of you came to uh, last year, Amory Lovins spoke and my college professor in 1977 handed me Amory's uh, article on energy strategy, The Road Not Taken, as a freshman in college, where he posited that we, don't need, we did not need to build hundreds of new power plants Instead, we could use efficiency in renewables, and he showed a 50-year supply curve of what was possible. And I decided then and there that I wanted to be a part of that. And I've been working in that field now for, you know, since, since then, 45 years. And uh, good news was Amory was largely correct into what we could achieve. Of course, the challenging news is that there's so much more to go. Next slide, please. So I'm going to have some fun with it. Um, you know, I would, I would argue that, you know, well, first off, I said the answer is blowing in the wind, so I'll go, so I'll do. Uh, <laughs> How many rows? I can, I can do that. This is supposed to be Catherine, you know, you'll have to indulge me. Um, I'm not playing any more than that. But um, wind is, you know, when I, in the year 2000, I did a study with ComEd about the potential for wind in Illinois. And we concluded that it wasn't great. And I'd ask, the, I'd ask, I wish we could ask a question, why was it not great? But the answer was that we were looking at wind maps that basically had uh, wind at 35 feet off the ground. Uh, as we know, there's these behemoths. We didn't think to go up high enough to uh, evaluate. And it was not a, it was not a, big, a big study. It was more of a, of a, of a, pay, of a resource study. But the, uh, the amount of wind that's happened in Illinois is simply stunning in the last 20 years. These are wind maps, is just a quick, you know, the wind farms are all over the state. Those uh, little cog wheels are the manufacturing facilities. And uh, I'll just give you a few statistics about wind. I mean, we're now sixth in the nation, uh, the rank sixth in the nation. We've got over 5,000 megawatts, and there's about 60,000 megawatts, or 60, six, between 60 and 70,000 installed megawatts of power capacity in the state of Illinois. It's about 7% of the total now. Um, its technical potential is about five times the total installed capacity, over 160,000 megawatts, over 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind if we jumped into the lake. Um, but, you know, we are, you know, we've got over 3,000 turbines in the state. I, I personally drove to Montana a couple of weeks ago and back. It's stunning the amount of wind energy in the country. And there is so much under development, and there is a tremendous momentum going in that whole arena. So, you know, from the standpoint of wind, um, you know, it, it powers at this point about 1.3 million homes in the state of Illinois, or it can. Um, and we've just got, you know, there's been, a, and we have a renewable portfolio standard, you know, in the state, which requires the utilities and the retail electric suppliers to generate about 25% of their electricity sales uh, from renewables by 2025 and wind 
is a part of that. So um, by having new wind, um, you know, and then also the combination of solar. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Um, that wind has been a, a big dynamic. Now, obviously, you're not putting wind power in your home. Now, solar, um, you know, the future is so bright, I'm going to wear shades in this regard. So now I'll take off my shades. Uh, Jennifer, are you looking? Come on, Jennifer. I need a smile from you. There we go. Okay. Hi, Shelly. I didn't tell you I was doing that. So when, when we look at solar and we think about the possibilities, the, um, you know, it basically, the big, the big picture is there's never been a better time to invest in solar. Uh, the solar prices have dropped like a rock over the last 10 years. They've gone down by nine times. Um, you know, Tesla has gotten into this, you know, at a buck 50 per watt. Uh, you know, the, uh, the improvements that the Chinese have made in the multi-crystal crystalline silicon modules have been extraordinary. And, you know, my, my, my Republican, former Republican cousin uh, in the legislature, Todd Sieben, uh, installed just a, a solar system on his house in Geneseo, Illinois, this last year. And I was out visiting him and he's, you know, it, it cost him after credits and everything else was extremely reasonable. He's net, he's pushing power back into the, to the grid. And when you look at the pricing of solar uh, and the growth of, of that technology, now again, it's from a relatively small base of total usage, but we have the potential for a dramatic revolution in this arena as well. And Kelly, I know you'll give a little bit more um, regarding that. And, and um, you know, I think the question that many homeowners would say, you know, I mean, is this the time to go solar? Well, if you've got a roof, you should be examining it. Um, there are other ways that you can uh, that you can that you can uh, participate. There's uh, you know in Illinois, Shines is the rooftop solar, which looks at new solar projects that you can install in your home. Uh, there's the Illinois Community Solar Program that allows you to to buy in to share an offset uh, offsite solar projects where you can have a part participation in that. Um, and there's also Illinois Solar for All, which you know AECOM is also involved. I mean that the, these are uh, programs that are targeted for solar and low income uh, environmental justice communities. So there's a tremendous uh, growth in that whole arena. And then the last area I'll cover is, is battery storage. Um, now this is uh, the next slide. The the uh, the interesting dynamic is that we you know it's great to have all this wind. It's great to have everything, but how do we store it? Because we've never really had a a uh, good way or a cost-effective way to store to store power. Um, this statistic, and I'm not even going to really get into the details in great, but you can just see the volume of storage that's growing. Um, and a lot of this is for the grid. Um, over 35 mil megawatts, uh, gigawatts is being developed, which is like 35 power plants, large-scale power plants between now and 2025 being put in place, which can be helping, you know, at the grid level and the reason that the, this is such a, a growing market is that the technology innovation uh, has been dramatic. Um, we also have a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, it provides, uh, you know, th there's been a lot of, uh, you know, investment. Argonne is doing a tremendous amount with uh, advances in energy storage technologies, lots of improvements there. And, you know, the investments of what's going on. I mean, and, and we, we're doing a lot with the electrification of vehicles uh, at AECOM. Uh, you know, some of you have seen uh, what Amazon is doing, promoting, um, you know, that they're, they're, they're at least running ads saying we're going all renewable, and they're looking at decarbonizing the supply chain. You know, how will they do that? What does that look like? Uh, you know, and of course, what we do in the United States, obviously, it's a worldwide market, and many organizations are doing a lot. I'd like to just jump to the final slide, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, so at AECOM, We've got tremendous renewable experience all over uh, the world. And uh, this project out at Fort Carson uh, in uh, Colorado is a battery storage system. You know, the, the military uh, is a driver of a lot of these investments. Uh, and you, you, know, you, you see a lot of investments in, in grid scale solar, uh, renewables. So it's, it's uh, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I personally believe we're going to see a regime change in the United States in a couple of months. And we are going to have a Herculean effort uh, under our uh, to uh, to achieve the potential for renewables globally, and we have not a moment to waste. So, with that, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Craig. There's some really good insights there. And if you're looking for a few takeaways, you don't want to watch the whole session, uh, you can do solar. There are still credits available on the state and the national level in terms of credit. Uh, also, there's um, community solar, which you can subscribe to. You don't actually pay off to put up the panels yourself. So those are two options. And speaking of options, I'm going to bring in Kelly here. And Kelly has been working with agencies and, and lots of clients to, to do a lot of this, uh, especially uh, Illinois Solar for, our, for All. Um, and, and there's also another consideration here in, in that going to renewable energy is going to help the environmental justice issue. A lot of uh, communities that are underserved are disproportionately hurt by pollution, uh, by any number of environmental maladies that, that cause a very, very drastic and pronounced health effects over time. So Kelly, tell us what you're doing. I, I know you're doing a lot of really important work right now. Sure. Thank you so much, John. Um, uh, I don't have any props, uh, but Craig uh, said something that I, uh, he said a lot, but the pro, if, if you don't remember anything else, Craig said, if you have a roof, you should be looking at solar. Um, and I echo that. I echo that sentiment. I just want to talk just a little bit about a couple of things um, in the time that we have. I'm always excited when I get to talk about the intersection of renewable energy and diversity, or EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, two very important topics that I'm passionate about. So um, in my years in the energy and environmental sustainability field, I've had opportunities to see great successes and to see great opportunities. Um, a couple of programs that we have here in Illinois, you've heard about a little bit, I wanna talk about a little bit more. Um, they're run by the Illinois Power Agency and you've got Illinois Shines, you heard that mentioned. It's also known as the Adjustable Block Program. Illinois Shines is a, um, a cooler name. Um, and Illinois Solar for All. Both of them offer the opportunity for solar either on your own rooftop or to subscribe to a share of the output from a larger, more centralized installation. Illinois Solar for All has a focus on underserved participants and communities. The goal of the program is basically what the title says, solar for all, um, even those who might not otherwise be able to afford it, which is what I get so excited about. With solar for all, there's no upfront cost. Um, any ongoing costs can't, talk, can't be more than half of the value of the energy that's produced by the system. Um, there is an income qualification which means you can't make over a certain amount of money. But I'll admit, I was surprised when I learned what those thresholds were. For instance, a household of four in Lake County, the threshold is an annual income of $63,000. That surprised me. Um, lots of people here, there's an income qualification and automatically say, probably not for me, but it could be. But if you don't remember anything else I say today, Remember this, Illinois Solar for All, you can Google it, the website. Uh, there's lots of great information. Um, I serve on the management team for the program. And one of my roles is to facilitate the Environmental Justice Self-Designation Committee. Um, a quarter of the funds of the program are designated for environmental justice communities. And these are communities that are defined based on a demonstrated higher risk of exposure to pollution based on environmental and socioeconomic factors. So at the beginning of the program, all of the communities in Illinois were assessed and some of them were designated as EJ, environmental justice communities. Um, but just because your community might not be designated, it doesn't mean it can't be designated, which is where our committee comes in. There's a self-designation process. So if you're not already designated as an environmental justice community, you can basically come to the committee and say, I'm not, but I should be. Um, there, there, here are a few examples. Um, if you need to have some supporting documentation, white papers or news articles or some other kind of support that shows that your area has a higher rate maybe of COPD than the state average. Um, 
your community maybe has held protests about fair housing and affordable housing crisis. Or maybe you live near a cleanup site that's not yet part of the EPA database. Um, so my point is this, just because your community isn't designated as environmental justice community doesn't mean the buck stops there. There's an opportunity for you to appeal to the committee and make your case. Um, there's a mapping tool on the Solar for All website. So you type in your address and it'll tell you whether or not you're already in a community that's designated as environmental justice. Um, and if you're not, then you can go through the self-designation process. Um, and again, the importance or the significance is uh, there's a portion of the money, a quarter of the money for the program is designated for environmental justice communities. Um, and, and what we find is that these are underserved, in many cases, underserved communities. And there's really a push to bring solar to those communities. So I'm really excited about that. And like Craig said, again, if you have a roof, you should be looking at solar. And this is just a way to help you do that. Um, the utilities have programs to help with energy efficiency. I was just on a call earlier today um, where North Shore Gas is giving out free energy saving kits to restaurants, um, both Peoples and North Shore. Um, there are bonuses now. I, I'd encourage everybody to go check out the utilities, check out the programs in the area. The other thing I wanted to talk about in the time that's mine is Lake County. Um, just let me shift gears a little bit because they're one of my clients um, and it's still on the topic of energy and the environment. Um, and Lake County is doing great things. Um, they won an award for having what I like to call a user-friendly approach to solar. Um, they've kind of taken the sting out of the whole permitting process. They've developed a checklist. Uh, there are lots of usable, um, valuable resources for both installers and um, residents as it relates to solar. And I would encourage more counties to follow Lake County's example and be solar friendly um, to make that process easier. Hot off the press, John stole a little bit of my thunder, <laughs> is the net zero policy. Um, I'm grinning. I've been grinning since we got close to getting it done. Um, Aiming for net zero carbon emissions. The goal basically is to balance the emissions with removal. Um, there's a commercial, and Craig alluded to it, but I still like to talk about it, where the guy's talking about the net zero goal for his company. And what he says is, um, it, I, I think it really drives home the point. What he says is that we don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but this is our goal. And that's very important. Um, you don't have to have it all figured out day one. Things change, you need time. Um, there are pieces that come together to make this happen. The first step is making that declaration that this is what we want to do. So uh, as far as Lake County, next up is putting together the energy efficiency plan and putting together the waste uh, reduction plan. Um, but the cool thing is Lake County is on the way. They have made that statement, they have made the commitment, and now we're moving forward to make it happen. So between Solar for All and Lake County taking big steps, I'm feeling really good about the direction in which we're heading. That's what I wanted to share with you today. I'm really excited about more conversation. I'm going to turn it back over to John. I think we're headed to Jennifer next. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Kelly. And, and I have to give Kelly a lot of credit. She had to step in. We had a huge hiatus uh, due to the COVID crisis, and we weren't working uh, as much as we'd like to in the Energy Environment Committee. But we're going to get to know Kelly very well, and it's a good thing. And we're going to make a lot of uh, get into the weeds on all the details we need to do. Yep. Uh, which brings us to Jen. Jen is is already in the trenches, and she's been doing so much work. But Jen, first, before we talk about uh, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which we all love. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about how many groups you represent. I kind of lost count, but it's, it's, a, it's a very broad coalition. 
and and you're it's kind of a miracle to me because whenever you get like three different environmentalists in the in a room they just it's tough to get them to agree in any one direction but they eventually do and you're doing it so tell us a little bit about iac and and, and what you're doing Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed Craig and Kelly's presentation. Kelly is on our board of directors and she's amazing. Um, and Craig, that's such great information and props. I do not have props. Um, I, uh, as I said, um, run the um, Illinois Environmental Council. I've been the executive director for almost 10 years now. Um, so it feels like I'm brand new, but 10 years. Um, and in that time, uh, we have grown. We have over 100 different affiliated organizations. Um, any group can join and become our member. And um, we're kind of like a trade association for environmental groups that are within Illinois. So making it a lot more efficient for groups to engage in lobbying and advocacy. Um, and we work on way more than just clean energy. I know land conservation is super important to um, Lake County as well. You can see. And Kelly's background, the state park map that we were just promoting, getting people outside during this pandemic and visiting and supporting our natural areas like state parks or um, your facility too. So I um, want to really briefly go into what's going on with policy. And I think, I don't have a prop, but I did see a funny tweet this morning. I guess it's not funny. But when you think about um, what's going on right now, like in the West, the sky is literally a different color. So I don't understand how people can still say we shouldn't be doing this or we can't afford it um, or uh, it, it's not the right policy. Like the sky color changed. We, we need to do something. We have an urgent need to do something and we need to act on this um, before we see, uh, I don't know what else is next. But um, I'm going to present a little bit on the Clean Energy Jobs Act and the, the policies that we've done in the past. And you know, these policies, they do make a difference working with whether it's your state government or local government. I mean, um, big corporations have known that working with government has been effective for all time. That's why they spend a lot of money lobbying and a lot of money doing this. And there are so many ways that the fossil fuel industry is propped up um, in Illinois, whether it's through the capacity auction system um, or through direct subsidies, uh, and we need, uh, we need to, to move past that and the pollution from the fossil fuel system. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, you know, one of, in 2016, one of our bright spots, a month after the current president's election, we passed the Future Energy Jobs Act, which included all of these programs that we've talked about today, Illinois Shines, the Community Solar Program, Illinois Solar for All, um, all of those came out of the Future Energy Jobs Act, um, which we're looking at 12 to $15 billion in new private investment. Go to the next slide. 70% um, of that was from solar and energy efficiency. Uh, and the, where, we'd like, where that will go is powering over a million homes by next year with solar and wind energy even faster than we thought, um, bringing Illinois Solar for All to disadvantaged communities. And it had a ton of things on energy efficiency. If you go to the next slide here, um, I have some numbers on jobs, and um, these are from 2018. We're, we're a little higher in 2019. I do have to say, unfortunately, the job losses from the pandemic have been expected to be 30 to 40,000 people in Illinois in the clean energy sector alone. Um, it is hitting hard, um, accompanied with the solar jobs cliff from, uh, from the policy that's out there. Um, but over 100,000 clean energy jobs in Illinois and one of the things that people don't expect, I know we're talking about renewables today, um, but 70% of those jobs are in the energy efficiency sector. Um, it's a quiet giant of renewable energy um, and it's jobs that you can't move anywhere else. Um, we've been so proud of the way that the different industries have adapted to be safe during the pandemic, um, whether it's virtual energy efficiency tours or all the things that you can do with solar without going anybody's home. And just to reiterate, if you have a roof, you should be looking at solar right now. It's copying what Craig and Kelly said. You got, it's, it's the time. It is time for you to do it. Um, and so uh, other portions of this program, we included training programs that um, have done a great job of enrolling and finding jobs for participants, um, really looking at uh, participation from people of color in low-income communities, really looking at people who are returning citizens and foster care alumni, 
Um, and so uh, that programming has been really important. Um, and to build on those, if you go to the next slide, um, we have been working on the Clean Energy Jobs Act, um, which we have four pillars, 100% renewable energy by 2050, a carbon-free electric sector by 2030, an increase in electrification of the transportation sector, all centered around jobs and investments in communities across the state with a huge focus on equity. And this bill um, has had, uh, we've had amendments coming out, but lots of iterations. And this is a bill that um, will solidify our clean energy future and the policy of the entire state of where we wanna go. It's extremely detailed. Um, and we look at new programs for um, getting people uh, jobs and job training. Um, you know, one of the things we learned from the job training program is that uh, wraparound services are really important. So making sure that people have the ability to um, get to the job site, the equipment they need, um, all of those type of items, even childcare if they need it, just to make sure that people can be successful and that we're removing barriers to employment and that this program, uh, we anticipate that in some of these, increasing Illinois Solar for All, um, and obviously uh, just huge increases in renewable energy. A look at closing all of the coal and natural gas plants by 2030. That's actually something um, the Biden plan puts forward as a carbon-free power sector by 2035. Um, so like these things are coming and we want to be first in Illinois um, and I, I think it's really important not from a, not just from a renewable energy perspective um, but also from a perspective of econ economy and economic development. I think I have one more slide but I will say you know during if you want to go to oh I don't um, but if you look at during the pandemic um, you would think you know maybe this is spending money etc but I think that and people would be really concerned with all of the economic downturn, but um, people are more excited about doing this than ever before. We just did a recent poll where 82% of Illinoisans said that they supported the Clean Energy Jobs Act. That's up from 68% uh, supporting the Future Energy Jobs Act um, just five years ago. So huge amounts of support and um, people want the jobs and economic development that this will bring. And they're looking at what we're going through right now and how we're horribly handling the, the crisis that's going on. And if we can't handle this crisis, how are we going to handle all of the things that the climate crisis is bringing to Illinois and to all communities in the state? Um, so this is the solution that, that we put forward that um, has so many benefits for the state and um, you know, contact your lawmaker about it. We're trying to aim for getting it done during veto session or early 2021, because uh, this is more urgent than ever. So. Thanks uh, for having me on. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jen. And I, I just want to note that Jen's right on here. I mean, this, this is beyond crisis mode. We are now into the asking the question, what kind of spiritual legacy do we want to leave for future generations? And we got to do it now. We should have done it yesterday. We should have done it 20 years ago. But now is our opportunity. And there's, there's certainly many opportunities I see here just based on what our, our esteemed panelists are telling us. So many opportunities. Um, so I want to I want to shoot one quick question before we go to uh, questions from our audience. And and again, this is kind of a layered question, but what can what should we be doing now to get us, you know, uh, the biggest bang for our buck? I, I personally I, I like everybody's comprehensive approach here, but a lot of people are thinking, you know, one what should I do? I think solar is a pretty good thing, but maybe there's some other things. So what should I do, meaning individuals, and what should we do, meaning government, society uh, at large? So, uh, Jen, why don't we start with you? Sure. I mean, first, make sure you're voting and you know who the people are that you're voting for, what their positions are. It's really, I say more than ever, voting and advocacy are actually the most eco-friendly tip that I will give you. So, do that and then make sure that the lawmakers that um, you that represent you are supporting clean energy policies. Um, that's a really important step right now. And even if they always support it or they never support it, keep on them. Thank you. Excellent advice. Everybody should be registering now. Uh, sign up for those mail-in ballots. Um, you know, we can do it. I think more than half the population is going to be voting this next election, but now's the time to start doing it. Uh, Kelly, what do you think? Um, let's see, what would I add? I would add, answer, your, answer the census. I would add, uh, do your 
research and take advantage of what's out here. Um, there are resources available at one point. People thought that there were things that couldn't be done because they couldn't afford it, but there are resources available. So um, don't try to go it alone. Thank you. And Craig? Well, I, I do think that, you know, looking at your home, you know, what you can do at home, uh, voting, obviously, and, uh, you know, supporting companies that you, when you buy things, supporting companies and just thinking about what you value and uh, investing in what you value. I mean, this, the scale opportunity is really going to be an infrastructure size for, you know, to really bend the curve down to the extent we can. So that's a much bigger set of challenges. And it's also global. When we think of the Chinese and, you know, the Indian, the worldwide, I, I'm particularly intrigued about the, you know, there's, there are elements of the pandemic in terms of, you know, we're not traveling as much. Um, some of the things, you know, what do we hold on from this period of time, which gives us the ability to have a high impact life but do not necessarily have to uh, travel the globe for meetings. Uh, air travel is very is very expensive, and uh, you know it's very it's very resource consuming. So I do think that some of the ways when we do return to hopefully with a vaccine, you know, what does life look like, and how can we look at um, systemic changes that 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 can give us high quality of life with without the carbon the attendant carbon as much and mm -hmm. relates to our, you know, our, our, our agricultural infrastructure, where our food is coming from, how it's being grown, uh, the resources that are deployed. And I, but I do think we're, we're in a seismic shift period of time. So that's, that's a, it's a really intriguing, um, this, a, a lot of different dynamics uh, that are, that are operational. Thank you so much. That, that's excellent. And I should, uh, make one more local comment that here in Lake County, we are experiencing record amounts of rainfall. Uh, we've had uh, more than five flood stage events, you know, this year. We're probably going to experience more. We're experiencing loss of species and biodiversity. So uh, even though it looks like the rest of the world's getting hit, hit harder, Lake County's still getting hit hard. And we need to address that as the best we can. So at this point, we are going to get back to Catherine, who has some questions. Yeah, so we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from one of our many bird lovers asking about the uh, one of the photos that was shown of wind turbines. Can we choose only wind turbines without blades to cut down on bird fatalities? And maybe you can speak um, to some of the research around that. Craig, why don't you uh, pick that one up? Uh, I think I don't, that'd be good for you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot about it. I know that, I, 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 would, I wonder whether, uh, when we look at the loss of bird populations that we've had, how much of it is pesticides, how much of it is land use policies versus the turbines, you know, blowing, or, you know, the other day they, they posited, they suggested 30 million migratory birds passing through per day. Uh, turning the lights off in downtown Chicago. So I, I do know that, you know, that is a factor. I don't know how big of a factor it is in migratory. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I do not have detailed knowledge of that. Jen, might you have any? Well, I just, I know we have a fact sheet that we worked on um, with both um, Audubon and the wind industry that um, coal plants kill a lot more birds than wind turbines, a lot more. Um, and so, I mean, you know, of course there are challenges and, um, you know, as we can improve technology to make birds and bats, um, Indiana bats also uh, can be endangered by um, some of the locations of turbines, especially in Illinois. Um, we should definitely work towards that. Um, we should work towards systems like there is a pollinator certification for solar that you can get to um, have pollinator friendly plants in your solar field. Uh, we should make sure that those things are all working together. But um, if, you know, wind turbines have been accused of, of birds because of uh, poor sighting at a California site, and, and there are birds that are killed by it. Um, like you said, so many more are killed by, um, by coal, and that doesn't even count the other things like buildings or pesticides or, or other sources. So um, 
I think we should work to improve, but uh, let's get rid of coal. Thank you, Jen. And I'm hardly an expert in this field, but I did see an Audubon presentation two nights ago. Uh, and the largest killer of birds is actually feral cats, billions. Uh, and wind turbines are kind of at the bottom of the list. So that's that's available through the Audubon Society. That's my source. And and Jen, what is your, your website? Why don't you throw that out there for us? Sure, I'll put it in the chat too, but you can okay. go to IEC at ilenbyro.org and we're on like every social media platform at, at ilenbyro as well. Thank you. And look in the chat box for that too. Uh, Catherine, another question, please. Next question. How dependent is Illinois on the actions that are taken at the federal level? Why don't you go with that, Jen? Yeah, that is um, such a great question. Um, so there's a lot of things that, on the energy sector, there's a lot of things at the federal sector that really impact us. I mean, I talked about um, the capacity auction, which is a complicated, I won't go into it, but just know that the federal government, especially the Trump administration, is setting rules in the way that energy is purchased and bought that drastically um, give subsidies to the coal and natural gas industries. And, you know, that has a strong impact on Illinois. Like the Waukegan coal plant in Lake County is only open. The only reason it's open is because of these capacity markets and the federal policy. Otherwise it would be closed. Um, there's no justification to have it. There's, there's no need. Um, and so uh, I think that's something important to think about, but um, you know, when it comes to other laws, like all of these environmental rollbacks that are happening at the federal level, um, you know, there's ways that we can continue in, in how we're, we're enforcing the law anyway. Um, but, you know, there, there are, uh, the federal government can damage the work that we're doing and we can be fighting against them to um, get to the policies that we want rather than um, them getting out of our way and letting us do what we want or, or the other way. So. It, it does have an impact. Yes, uh, Kelly or Craig, you want to take a stab at that or pass? That's okay if you do. Okay, well, I, I should note since I'm also legislative chair of the county board that uh, there's been several executive orders passed to weaken regulations on air, uh, coal ash, wetlands, uh, rivers, um, you know, in the last three years or so. And um, they, they have, no, you know, without a doubt, weakened our environmental protection laws. Did, did you want to go, Kelly? I'm sorry, I was, um, I was unmuting, uh, thinking, John, you would be best to address that, um, given your, your activity on the board. Uh, but I, I would certainly echo the sentiment that um, to the extent that Illinois can stand strong, uh, regardless of many of the policies that might seek to weaken some of the environmental protections. Um, it's where we need to uh, stay focused on our lawmakers and make sure that we're doing what we can here. Okay, thank you, yeah, Craig. Tax policy clearly is, is important. Uh, how that can help both strengthen what consumers can do uh, as well as businesses. Um, and you know, federal federal legislation affects certain areas. Uh, the, the electric utility industry is largely, well, not as, as you suggested with the capacity markets. But what's been interesting about Illinois is that electricity, at least for, at the retail level, was about. And I'll get into the detail. You know, it was like eight cents a kilowatt hour when I started my career here in the mid 1980s, and it's essentially the same. We were one of the highest cost states. We're now one of the lowest cost states, um, and. It's remarkable that we continue to uh, address the volume of efficiency we can, cost effective, that we can offset electricity cost effectively at eight cents, nine cents. It's 17 to 20 cents on the East Coast per unit. Um, so I think that's been an interesting dynamic at the retail level with what consumers pay for. So one of the challenges we've had is getting customers' attention to pay attention to a cost which is stable or declining you know, your electric bill is less than your cell phone bill. And that's kind of stunning because I'd pay five times as much of a cell, as for my cell phone service or for my electric service and somebody told me I couldn't have it, right? Because our lives are completely connected in this way. 
So it's a bit of a conundrum, but, but I do think that the, that the, that the decarbonization uh, as an approach is a thinking mindset to the extent that the federal government can be supportive of those policy parameters and really take a leadership role, hopefully in the next series of administrations, a sustained effort in this regard in this last four years would be a complete aberration. Uh, that is my hope that we begin to see and that truly is the only thing that will really help us bend the uh, carbon curve down in the coming decades. Thank you. Catherine, another question, please. So this is pretty specific, um, but kind of gets into where I think individuals are thinking about how they can engage. Are there any solar incentives available currently for uh, multi-resident living spaces, apartment buildings, condo buildings? Uh, what did the cost look like? What does that process look like? Good question. Kelly, I see you nodding. The short answer is yes. Uh, there. Um, through both Illinois Shines and Solar for All, there are opportunities for multifamily buildings. Um, uh, the programs are different in that, uh, now my knowledge is more ingrained in the Solar for All program where there is no upfront cost. Um, and then any ongoing costs are um, embedded in the value of the system. Um, but there's also Illinois Shines that doesn't have the income component. Um, one of the things that the program does, though, uh, and through the website, Illinois SFA, solar for all, um, dot com or org, I always forget, try both, um, you'll, you'll find approved vendors. And I would encourage, don't, don't go by what I, what I tell you it's going to cost. I would encourage anyone interested to reach out to an approved vendor. Um, and get real information about, you know, they've got the latest and greatest on uh, what it costs. And every building is, is unique in the sense of how systems are placed and um, the, um, all that goes into pricing a system. Um, but Illinois SFA dot something can get you there. And I'd, I'd reach out to a couple of the approved vendors and, and get some more insight. But absolutely, there is um, there are opportunities for multifamily buildings. Thank you. Dot com, Kelly. Dot com. Thank you. Dot Thank com. You, dot com. Dot org. Okay. Teamwork. We got that. All right. Another question, please, Catherine. So this is a great question. This is uh, directed to Craig. Do you have any information on the engineering of air conditioners and how that's potentially changing in the future? As the climate warms and more people get access to electricity, can air conditioning become more efficient so that the power grid doesn't crash during extreme heat events? Well, a lot of that has to do with just a house being well sealed, um, using, uh, you know, and I, and I think the air conditioning uh, units are a lot more efficient than they ever than they ever than they were. The Energy Star rating system has helped really drive them up. Uh, the utility, the, the, a lot of times, the utilities have the incentives, and the reason that they, for those of you who may not know, why the utilities are in the business of energy efficiency, well, it actually costs less. Uh, if you think of efficiency as a resource, if you take ten buildings or ten homes, and you were to cut the usage at ten homes by ten percent, you're enabling by that 10 homes saving 10%, you're producing the energy that you can put into a new home. And it costs a lot less, about half the cost, to incentivize customers to use less energy than it does to build a new power plant. Uh, so some of that's technology, putting a new refrigerator, uh, putting a solar system on. Other is just simply thinking of the house being more efficient, uh, cutting leaks, uh, and, and doing things more efficiently. The other is, you know, cooling that which you need um, versus the, the whole enchilada, uh, you know, being smart, you know, with, with, with good thermostats and all that. The, uh, the technologies for the air conditioning have gotten better and better, but, you know, if we hadn't had air conditioning uh, as it was developed for, uh, and like ice and everything else, you never would have, uh, you know, people skating in uh, Florida in the, in the summertime for professional hockey or any number of people even living in southern climates. So I think if, the, if we can supply the power through renewables, then that's a, a big game changer there versus relying on the fossil fuels. Kelly, 
Would you add anything else to my musings on this one? Uh, I was looking for my mute button. Um, I, I echo, uh, I always um, encourage, use as little as you can and then figure out how to get assistance with the rest. So um, I, I always point to the utility programs. I am not aware of any drastic um, right. changes in the technology for air conditioning, you know, years back we had the change in the refrigerant. Um, I'm not aware of any of that on the horizon, um, near term anyway, as far as the technology itself. But I do know that um, from an energy efficiency standpoint, uh, looking for the most efficient units is always the way to go. Craig already mentioned the Energy Star label. Um, and then, the, the other clue that I would uh, direct you to are the utility programs. Staying on top of, when, when you look at something that the utility is encouraging, it's because there are new advances many times in that technology. Uh, so I would, uh, I'd look that in that direction for clues about what, um, what's new, what's latest, what's greatest, and what's coming. Did you want to add something, Jen? You are muted. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll put this in the chat, but like, I actually like just had to buy a fridge. Um, and I discovered like how difficult going through the appliance, like energy star has so much consumer reports has some stuff. Um, and just the same with, with AC, uh, come ad actually has an excellent appliance site where you can compare appliances to one another. Um, and then choose different places to buy it. Like, uh, you know, whatever I have to say about ComEd, like, I'm actually, I'm sure there was probably one of our affiliates that put to get that together for them. So um, yay, Enviro nonprofits. But I will put it in the chat and it is excellent. Thank you. And I just want to note, here's another takeaway. So look for Energy Star appliances uh, wherever you shop for appliances. And also keep in mind that you know, the utility companies, as Jen said, are really good sources for rebates, uh, you know, comparing models. Uh, we recently went with a tankless water heater and it's, it's 90 plus, you know, efficient and there's no tank to heat all the time. Our, not only did our gas go, gas bill down, went down a lot, uh, 20, 30%, but uh, there's a lot less carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere. So that's always good to know. I think we have time for one more question, Catherine. Okay, we are going to um, take it out on a big one. All right. How, how, uh, how do you think zero waste strategies are, how relevant are they in relation to climate action plans and energy related efforts? Ooh, that's a tough one. Jen, why don't you start off? Yeah, this is my favorite topic. I mean, I, I think I've started a lot of um, a lot of what uh, my role, I started a lot with recycling education when I grew up in DuPage County. Um, and, you know, I would say like doing the things that we're doing is really important. Just the steps that you take at home, um, whether it's recycling or energy efficiency, et cetera, um, they, they are meaningful and it does lead to, um, you know, some behavior change and thinking about what you're doing, I think. Um, but if you look at where carbon pollution is being produced, um, I'm, not, I'm gonna get this wrong, but Sunrise Movement always brings this up, like something like 70% of carbon emissions are from big corporations. And, you know, those yeah. are the companies creating all of these different products. Um, I've been struggling around a lot of the recycling and waste issues lately with, you know, China not accepting, um, all of the different types of contaminated plastics, uh, just the way that those different markets are going. And City of Chicago has a 7% recycling rate. I know that Lake County, um, you are all awesome and you have a lot of composting things and recycling and um, I think it's almost a 40% rate. But I do sometimes wonder if, um, you know, these recycling systems are just making us feel less guilty about all the stuff that we're buying. Um, and whether that, uh, you know, that actually should be the focus of what we're doing. And I'm, I'm going through sort of, sort of an existential crisis of reevaluating the work that we're doing 
um, to think a little bit more about um, consumerism, um, the way that uh, it impacts labor and wages, but also the way it impacts communities. Um, there, you know, if you look at it, there's a lot of environmental justice communities that are negatively impacted by recycling facilities that we don't think about because it went away, but they're dealing with the metal shredders, they're dealing with the plastic recycling, the transfer station um, that we just dutifully, you know, put into our recycling bin and it goes away and we don't see it. So lots of challenges in that system as well. And um, I do think like the overall production and consumerism and, and the search for zero waste is a really important one. Um, and I want to tackle it by making companies do the right thing through policy. Thank you. Craig Granfinelli. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's intriguing on a, on a, like, you know, with land use. I mean, I, I have a, you know, when you compost, you throw away very little. And when you think about plastic and what you buy and how we package, um, you know, I, I think about Amazon and how much packaging seems to be, you know, put together. It's extraordinary, the volume of packaging, the plastics in the, the world. Um, it's uh, from a decarbonization standpoint, it's, uh, it's important. Clearly, it's part of it, but there are bigger systemic impacts that if we do better, like the, like the power structure, power infrastructure, pollution from that, that's, there's the bigger games to play, but it's, you know, it's obviously a barrier and obviously a variable. And it also is kind of, you know, good, good personal practice and good business practice and good legislation uh, as well as Jen alluded to. Thank you, John and Kelly to you for the final final. <laughs> oh, I thought we were done. I just want to encourage everyone out there to just continue because you're on this, on, you're, you're listening today. So we already know that you've got a mind for what's going on with the environment. Just continue to be good environmental stewards and do everything that we're supposed to do. If we as individuals do what we're supposed to do, then that grows and grows and grows. Um, there was a question about whether the utility does things in private homes. Absolutely. They've got programs where they'll send someone to your home, probably less now with COVID, but um, they give some recommendations for private homes. But everybody do what you can do. And then um, I, I'd love to, my grand finale, the world will be a better place. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. That's, mm. that's, that's such a wonderful thought to leave everybody, everybody with. So I want to thank our wonderful panelists, our excellent host, Catherine, our, our even better host, uh, Brushwood, and our many sponsors. And uh, if you want to take a poll, it, it should be flashing up here. Uh, you can reach or contact or find out more about our hosts uh, and our panelists on the Brushwood site. Uh, hopefully, Catherine will send that to you. And also, just keep in mind, voting's important, elections matter, you can empower yourself to do anything you need to do, uh, just choose one thing and, and do it. Uh, there are any number of environmental groups always looking for volunteers, and uh, you can be engaged, and, and now is a really good time. So thank you so much for your kind attention, and we hope to see you out there on the trails. So take care. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to just give a little time for everyone to complete the poll. Um, it's just five questions. So if you can do that briefly, we so appreciate the feedback. And this was just such an inspiring conversation. Thank you to each of you, Craig, Kelly, Jen, and John for joining. You know, I feel inspired and more hopeful just knowing that you are helping to lead us into this new cleaner, greener future. Um, that's rooted in equity and, and these bigger systemic issues that we really do need to address as a society and as a community. So thank you. Um, I encourage everyone to join our next symposium presentation next week. We're actually going to be diving in even further to the environmental justice topic featuring Celeste Flores and uh, Dulce Ortiz, who will be speaking about Clean Power Lake County and their efforts um, along the environmental justice lines in, uh, in Lake County specifically. So do, don't miss that. Um, thank you, take care, and we will give just another few seconds for wrapping up the poll. Thank this you is for great. From an in-person uh, event, Catherine, thank you. Thank you. Good job. Yes. <laughs> Next year in person. Next yes. year in person. Exactly. <laughs>
Hopefully. <laughs> and don't forget to tune in to Bill McKibben. He's coming up. When, when is that? I'm gonna, here's, here's the time to plug in. Yes, on <laughs> October 9th. October 9th, October 9th, what time? What time? At 7 p.m. And we okay. have the information on our website at brushwithcenter.org. And we'll be emailing everyone who's registered for this event as well with reminders. Excellent. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have Thank a great you. day. You too.